Hello, welcome. Um, we're doing something very different this time. I know we were in Genesis and we were dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah. We were all waiting for the response of Lot fleeing from the destruction of the cities. Uh, but we decided in the nativity season we'd do something different here over these next few weeks. I thought, wouldn't it be fun to just kind of work through the two nativity narratives we have in Matthew and Luke? I don't know, maybe spell out for people who these individuals are, what some of these odd things mean in the gospel text. The gospel text happened to be very bare bones, as many of you know. Uh, and so I kind of want to flesh this out a little bit and think about, perhaps even go so far as to say, well, what's the way in which the New Testament works with regards to biblical literature? Is it a great book, even? I mean, I think in the Western tradition, the gospel texts are the most important books that we have. But I don't know that that means it's a great book. And I think we can wrestle with those questions. Just so you know, I think it is a great book. I just think we have to define the literary qualities of the New Testament somewhat differently than how we define great literature and other works. Do I think the New Testament is as beautiful and as literary as the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament? I don't. I don't think it's working by the same poetic principles that the Hebrew Bible does. Does it use parallelism? Of course it does. That's just what the ancient world uh, utilizes in both its prose and its poetry. But the way in which it tells its story, I'll, I'll just say this. It doesn't take as long to develop them. You get parables, you get teachings, you get what are called pericopes, these little inset stories inside of stories. Nevertheless, I think there is something really wonderful about uh, the New Testament. But one of the things I think Christians have to look to, if you want to see the literary quality, you almost have to take the literary quality as an exegetical statement. What does that mean? It means, what's the way in which Christ fulfills Scripture? Now, again, when I say Scripture, what that means is the Hebrew Bible. For, for the Jews of the New Testament, it would not have been the Old Testament. It would have been simply Scripture. Uh, anytime the New Testament refers to Scripture, it's not referring to itself. This is important to keep in mind, I think. If we're going to take the literary quality of, of the, the New Testament seriously, and if we are, then let's kind of situate it just for a moment. Matthew and Luke are written, say, somewhere around 50-plus years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. What does that mean? That means you have a church that has existed for 50 years. So that means we have to understand what's the gospel message of the New Testament. And I want to keep this very simple. As you guys all know, we don't try to be denominational on this channel. I'm Eastern Orthodox. This isn't an Orthodox reading. It's just simply trying to situate us in the history and the culture, what they're trying to do. And what the New Testament tries to do is to show the way in which Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And the only way they can do this is by showing, demonstrating, by incorporating those lines from Scripture inside of the New Testament to demonstrate the way in which it's a fulfillment and an extension of and a completion of what Scripture, the Old Testament, had always promised. So uh, we need to understand that and begin there, because a lot of the New Testament will not make any sense if you don't know uh, the Hebrew Bible and its uh, predictions of a Messiah, whatever that Messiah may be. Is he a king? Is he a priest? Is he a prophet? Let's, let's leave that up in the air. 
although I do think the New Testament answers, he is in fact a king and a priest and a prophet. I think it's those things, especially a king and a priest. But let's leave those up there because that's what it's trying to participate in. It's trying to ask those, those pertinent questions. And here you get with Matthew and Luke, I think Matthew is a very, very Jewish writer. I think he has a Jewish audience. I think he's trying to retell throughout his entire gospel. I think he's very focused on the Exodus story and what it has to do with the Passover, Pascha, Easter. What does it have to do with the death and resurrection of Christ? And I'm going to propose this, that even in these first two chapters, even in the first two chapters, I think he's already thinking about what does the crucifixion and resurrection mean to all of this, to the life of Christ, to the Old, to the Old Testament, to Scripture itself. So I, I, I want to begin here thinking out loud, certainly not in any systematic way, but thinking out loud about what does it mean if this is in fact a a great literary work. And, and I happen to think Matthew and Luke are. I certainly think the Gospel of John is for very, very different reasons, but an incredible work of literature, a great book. But here with Matthew and Luke, I think it's the same, and they're quite different. What I'm not going to do, because as you know, we like to express and define what we do and what we don't do. What I will be doing is teasing out for you all of the historical, cultural import of these things that we see with regards to an eye towards that Christian theology of the crucifixion and resurrection. Great. What I won't be doing is putting Matthew and Luke side by side to show all of their contradictions. How can he be here in Matthew, when he's here in Luke, etc., etc. I find that all very banal and, quite honestly, very boring. And it may be because I'm an English professor, and um, um, my notion of truth is the truth of Christ crucified and resurrected. I don't need historical veracity with these stories lining up perfectly. What I think our writers are trying to get at is some sort of theological truth through these narrative details and the way in which it, it fulfills what we see in the Hebrew Bible. So just know that because I don't want you to be horribly, horribly disappointed as we work through these things, hoping I'm going to line up all of the gospel discrepancies. That's just not my thing. I'm not going to look at that. What I will look at is the beauty of the insights here. Let me just give you the first one. <laughs> the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 1 begins with a genealogy. For those of you looking to write a great book, let me give you just a small piece of advice. Do not begin your great book with a genealogy. We call this in the Orthodox Church, those of us who are deacons, this is the curse of deacons because we have to, we have to chant this out loud. All of these horrible names that we hope we remember how to pronounce. Do we do an American pronunciation? Do we do a Greek pronunciation? Do we do a Near Eastern pronunciation? It's absolutely miserable. And, you know, let the burden be ours. But you don't begin a great book like this. Nevertheless, nevertheless, <laughs> let me just argue for the Gospel of Matthew is spectacular because he has his eye on Exodus. And you'll note that his genealogy begins with Abraham was the father of Isaac. Just stop there. This is a very, very Jewish text. It is the history of Israel. For those of you who have been following our discussions of Genesis, you know what we focus on. Chapter 12, Abraham, the beginning of actual Israelite history. 
That's where the Gospel of Matthew begins. That is his, uh, that is his focus. He wants to make sure that we all understand that the Davidic line goes back to Abraham and that this is the beginning of the Israel nation that finds its promise in the Davidic, in the Davidic line that will be fulfilled in the Mashiach and the Messiah who is then with Jesus Christ. And, and for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you all know this, but for those of you who don't, um, uh, the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah, it simply means the anointed one. This is what Samuel does to both Saul and David. He anoints them. And this is where we get uh, uh, the word for Christos, uh, for Christ. He is, in fact, the anointed one. He is the Messiah. So for those of you who went through chrismation, a christening, whatever that may be, what all that means is you have been anointed in the line of Christ, the Mashiach, the Messiah, and that you are a full participant uh, in, in, in that salvation history. So let me begin here. Verse 18, chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce, divorce her quietly. Just stop. All right. This would be um, um, something unimaginable. You're betrothed to a young woman. Now she's pregnant. And what I think it's trying to show is that Joseph is a, is a good man. He's a patient man. He's not going to shame her. And that all seems well and good. And we'll get into Luke eventually. We'll get into Luke to give that portion of the story of this. But it's important to know this. And if you want to know the background of this, because here they are, it's just Joseph and Mary thrown into our lap. Like, we think we know a ton about this because we have all this tradition. We have all this great Christmas tradition. This is the Holy Family. What's going on here? Who are these individuals? If you want to know the ancient church's position on this, if you want to know the backstory, you have what's known as the Proto-Evangelium of James, written, say, around 150. It fills in the backstory. Many of you will say, well, that's not accurate. It's much later, even up to, say, 70 years later. But it's trying to fill in that backstory of who are these two people? What are they doing? In some ways, you can just read it, that they were two, I guess, young people. Maybe Joseph would have been slightly older. I don't know. Um, um, and she's younger. Again, I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. The Proto-Evangelium of James actually sketches it out for you. For those of you who are interested, Joseph was a widower. He was much older. Um, um, uh, Mary was kept at the temple at a young age. Uh, whenever it came time for her menstruation, it was time for her to leave the temple because Joseph was a widower and he was so much older. He took, he took Mary as a child, as a betrothed. But the understanding was she was quite holy. So when he sees what's going on here and now she's pregnant, Oftentimes we think he would be scandalized because he's her betrothed because she was unfaithful to him. Again, I'm not asking you to accept this tradition that's otherwise. But the other tradition would be he was horrified because he was told, you're in charge of this young woman. Like, protect her. Keep her from the world. She was a temple virgin. We've placed her in your care etc etc so just so you know that's what goes into that that other tradition I, I i i certainly implore you to go and read that proto evangelium of james it, it it fills in a lot of details 
again, whether accurate or inaccurate, you can see where it's filling in the gaps of the narrative. Because if you're reading it, you have really no idea what's going on. But we do know this. The fact that he resolved divorce her quietly, it's the easiest statement I can make. Joseph is a good man. He's just a good man. Like, he doesn't want to shame her. He doesn't want her stoned. He doesn't want her humiliated. He'll just do it quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel which means God is with us. That's Isaiah 7.14. Immediately, what do you see Matthew's trying to do? This is a messianic promise. This is a messianic promise. And I think it throws people off that Joseph, an angel comes to him in his dream, and Joseph is willing to listen to the angel. In the modern world, we think of dreams as only a manifestation of our psychological troubles. We're working through things throughout the day. We have to resolve them. And we can do this in our dreams. It gets rid of our anxiety or deals with our anxiety or perhaps makes our anxiety worse, whatever the case may be. Or we say, oh, I ate too much pizza before bed. We have a materialist response to it. I ate too much pizza um, uh, that's what messed up my dreams. I had heartburn and I could not focus in my dreams at all. They were these horrible things. Which, by the way, is fine. Those were, the, those were two categories in the ancient world. So we're not that far off from them. And, and I say this in, in a non-Freudian way. They certainly weren't, weren't Freudians at the time. But they certainly understood how psychological distress could in fact inform your dreams. But there was a third category, and that's one that we seem to have let go of, for a lack of a better term. And that is, no, it's actually real. Somebody actually does come and visit you. A soul visits you. An angel visits you. And they're giving you really important information. That's how I think we're supposed to take this. And that's precisely how Joseph takes it. He's not psychoanalyzing himself, going, oh my goodness. What if I do wrong by this young woman? He's not thinking of that. What he's thinking of is, this is an angelic visitor who's given me some revealed truth, and I must abide by this. This is, in, this is of a divine origin, and I must abide by this. I have a duty and a responsibility to go and do such a thing. This is his basic motivating force, I think, here. And again, it just shows him open to God. If he, if he resolves himself to divorce her quietly, that's a good man. And when an angel comes and speaks to him in his dream, that's a thoughtful, God-fearing man who understands the nature of those dreams. And so what we're going to do next time is we'll move into chapter 2. I know this seems so very, very quick. An angel comes to visit him. That's it. That's all we have with the nativity. Yes, but it seems to me pretty important to get an understanding of who Joseph is. And it will become important later on in the narrative that he's willing to listen to these angelic advisors. And he seems to be tuned into the divine. All sorts of things are going to play out in the Gospel of Matthew follow explicitly certain things in Exodus and other prophets, and Joseph seems to abide by them. The text doesn't make it explicit, but I think we're supposed to understand Joseph knowing full well, hmm, these are odd little things, and I'm going to abide by what God says, and I know Scripture, and Matthew is sitting there going, he knows Scripture. Look at how all of these things play out. So next time we'll jump into chapter two. Until then.